Cool. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, as I was saying to everyone that logged in uh, a little earlier, is, my name is Amelsa Quiroz. I'm the senior design manager here at Common Justice. I work in the communications department. Um, I'm going to let everyone on the panel introduce themselves and their titles. Um, Kira, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Kira Shepard. I'm the vice president of organizing and policy here at Common Justice. All right, Shuaib. You're muted, Shuaib. My name is Shuaib Abdul Rahim. I'm a trauma support manager here at Common Justice. Good morning. And Richard? My name is Richard Smith. I'm the National Director of United for Healing Equity here at Common Justice. Good morning, everyone. And Marjorie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marjorie. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a senior trauma support manager. And so excited to be here with all of you this morning and to, to start talking. All right, so the purpose of this webinar is just to, for really people who follow our work and people who, who love what we do as Common Justice to familiar, familiarize themselves with who we are a little bit um, and the really powerful team that makes Common Justice possible, um, which is not something that we've done in the past. So I'm super, super excited to get to do because we always talk about in the office how there are so many amazing and powerful people on, on staff that don't really get highlighted, um, who don't really, who aren't, uh, public facing as much because they're in direct service like Shuaib and Marjorie um, or Kira just joined us not very long ago and she's the very first VP of organizing and policy that we've had so we're super excited to have her join us and Richard some of you might be more familiar with Richard Smith he's the national director of United for Healing Equity and he does a lot of national talks so he's super powerful um, and we wanted to talk a little bit about the work that we do individually in our in our own departments um, and how it's unique for each one of us. Um, because obviously we work with violence and it's not getting people to think that a world without prisons is possible, it's hard enough already. Um, but getting them to think that we can still have a world without prisons and deal with the issue of violence is even harder. Um, and so my job as a commons person is constantly, um, well, one, dealing with trolls, people who, who don't agree with our messaging, who don't agree with what we do. Um, and so we just kind of wanted to uh, let you all into the world of common justice and, um, and how we do our work, right? Um, so a little bit about me, um, I've been here for a little over three years. Uh, one of the things that I love about working here is that we are truly an organization formed of really powerful people that do really powerful work, right? The work we do here is not sterile by any means. Um, there are times in which the work can be traumatic. Um, and as a person in communications, I'm sure my, my colleagues, Aliyah and D'Angelo, who are also here today, uh, will confirm um, one of our greatest challenges and also one of our greatest honors is to shift the narrative around violence and work to humanize our responsible parties to a public that sometimes wants to just see them as bad apples. People who deserve to be punished to the fullest extent of the law. I understand where that anger and frustration, and I understand that anger and frustration, what it stems from. Obviously, um, excuse me, my dog is trying to get in the room. As a person of color, specifically as a person of indigenous descent, I understand violence. It's the reason I exist. So I understand that that mentality of punishment is the perspective and the language of the colonizer who feels that it is their duty to tame and discipline and civilize people that they deem to be inferior, people that they see as inherently flawed and inherently violent. And I see this language a lot when we're talking about our participants, when we're talking about people who are criminally, who have involvement with the criminal legal system, right? We see this mentality 
reflected in the language and the media that the that the media uses when talking about white people who cause violent harm versus how they talk about people of color who cause violent harm. We saw this very recently with the shootings in Atlanta that left eight people dead in an act of anti-Asian hatred. The sheriff of Cherokee County said that the shooter did what he did because he was having a bad day. They never use that kind of language when it's a person of color um, causing another person harm. I have never in my life seen them justify or try to make it seem that they are, you know, just having a bad day. And that's what we're asking for. We're asking for that same kind of empathy that is applied to white men when they cause violence be applied to everyone else. Um, so our challenge as the communications department at Common Justice, I imagine is the same challenge that many organizations like ours face. The extremely difficult challenge of trying to describe water to fish. And what I mean by that is that white supremacy and violent language and violent and racist policies and perspectives are just part of the environment that we live in. And you don't see it and you don't notice it if it has never hurt you. White supremacy is at the very core of who we are as a nation and it seeps into everything. It has seeped into our criminal legal system as probably all of you are aware. It's seeped into our education system and even into the nonprofit world, which we are forced to function in. So a core part of what we do and what our goal is in communications is to shift that narrative around violence. And we do that by being extremely incisive and careful about the language that we use, which is why we use terms like survivor or harmed party instead of victim and responsible party, which you heard me just use, instead of perpetrator. So to explain that a little bit, our, our decision to use terms like survivor instead of victim, I'm gonna kick it over to Kira and how we are trying to make this movement to politicize the term survivor in the same way that the term victim has been historically politicized. Yeah, thank you for all of that really powerful um, beginning and start to this what's gonna be a powerful conversation, Emil say. Um, yeah, at Common Justice, we use the term survivor and survivorship. And when we talk about survivors, we talk about people who have been impacted by violence. So that can be domestic violence, um, interpartner violence, community violence, gun violence, assault, and also people who have been heavily impacted by systems of oppression. So, you know, a lot of black and brown people, as you were talking about, um, Emil say. And we do that as a way to like get away from terms used by the criminal legal system, such as victim. And, you know, the term um, victim um, has been used by folks in the criminal legal system and people aligned with the cr criminal legal system to in, in many ways like um, push for laws and policies that create more survivors, people heavily impacted by systems of oppression. And, and we know one of the hugest, largest systems of oppression is the criminal legal system, um, is prisons. And like one good example of this is like the victim's rights movement, which was started in like, started in like the late 1970s um, by this guy named Frank Carrington. Um, and he wasn't a victim. He was a, a police officer turned um, attorney who, was really big on law and order. You know, he, um, I always show his, his book because I feel like this book is just like a very sensational um, cover um, that really tries to pull at the um, hearts of um, people in the public regarding the pain and suffering that victims um, have felt in society at the expense of the people that caused the harm, who in many ways are victims slash survivors themselves. Um, so Frank was like, Carrington was really big against the Warren Court, which was seen at the time the Supreme Court, which was mostly like liberal justices. So a lot of people said the Warren Court was like too easy um, on people who caused 
harm or people who committed crime. So he was trying to push for harsher laws. Um, and this was all happening at the same time that there was this like movement. So like neoliberal politics where, which was pushing for smaller government um, and less services, which actually led to, and this is like ended the um, welfare state. So when you have all these people who aren't getting the services that they need in their community, what do you do with these people? What do you do with some of the problems that we have in our communities? What they end up doing was like, pushing them in prison. This is when we saw the rise of the carceral state. Angela Davis talks about um, this in her book on why prisons are obsolete. And at the time of the rise of the carceral state um, in like the 1980s, around the same time, we had something called, and this is another good example of how victims have been used to, to um, the plight of victims have led to more survivors, victims, when you talk about the rise of the carceral feminist movement. So the carceral feminist movement branched out of the anti-violence movement. And this is a movement that was started by women. It was a multicultural um, movement started by women, black women, brown women, um, white women, that really wanted to get at the root causes of domestic violence and interpartner violence. And they really had an intersectional um, systems analysis, basically. And a lot of people were saying that if we want to get the root cause of this violence, you actually have to put services back in our community that will prevent some of the violence that we saw. Their movement wasn't moving as fast as they wanted it to. So then all of a sudden it kind of switched gears and turned to this law policy, hard law and order type of movement. Um, and the face of this movement was basically white women. And they call it like, um, they call it the everyday woman, basically. And everyday woman suffers from domestic violence. That was really the white, white woman for the most part. And that led to stricter laws and policies. One good example of this is the um, Violence Against Women's Act, which was just recently reauthorized. And the Violence Against Women's Act, one of the many things it did was like push for mandatory arrests. So when so with mandatory arrest and the Violence Against Women Act did this by basically saying that states couldn't get federal dollars unless they had mandatory arrest policies. So mandatory arrest policies basically said that if a cop comes to someone's home um, once they get a call for domestic violence, and if they have reasonable cause to suspect that someone was harmed, they have to arrest someone, right? And oftentimes the person they would arrest was actually the person who was harmed, the survivor, the, the person who was a survivor of domestic violence. And oftentimes um, those folks were black and brown women because when the cops would come to the home and they couldn't discern who caused the violence. And we know that oftentimes people think that black women are their aggressor, brown women are angry, where the aggressors. Then sometimes they would um, arrest the women who were actually being abused. Or they were arrest the they were arrest the men. We saw a spike in arrest during this time. So all of this is happening, causing the rise. And, and actually, we know that the the everyday woman carceral feminist movement is part of the spike in the um, carceral state that we see today. So all of this is actually causing more people to go into prison, which is traumatizing more and more people, um, which is causing more survivors. And then they come out. And we know that one of the core drivers of violence is exposure to violence. So if you have all this, you're being exposed to all this violence in prison and then you come out, that's gonna drive you to cause more um, violence. So that's why like we're really big and steadfast about moving away from the term um, victim and using survivors because when you, when you don't see a survivor as someone who actually turns to the criminal legal system to get help and st instead as someone who's just like heavily impacted by systems of oppression, then you have to get to the root cause which is outside of the criminal legal system. And that root cause, what we're saying is basically putting more money and services into our communities and giving our people what they need to heal from the various ways they've been harmed um, in the past and the various ways they're being harmed today. And one of the ways that we're trying to do that is we have, um, you know, we're starting organizing work and we're trying to create a member base of survivors of violence. And we're trying to work with them to like ask for and to push the government to give them what they need to heal from harm and to feel safe in their communities. 
And we just started doing these um, listening sessions, but they've been really powerful, even over Zoom. Um, and some of the things that people say that they want is like, you know, access to like better mental health services, access to like housing, um, parent counseling classes, community centers. Like these are things that like um, folks in our community have been asking for for a long time. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Kira. Um, that's super informative, thank you. Um, so now we're gonna shift it to Richard Smith, which I'm sure many of you are um, already very familiar with. Um, so Richard, as the National Director of for United for Healing Equity, you've done a lot of research to try to pathologize the way that trauma shows up in BIPOC communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that work that you're doing? Yeah, um, thank you, MLC. Um, I think, you know, I have to start by saying that like, this is work that's been done um, by folks who have been in the trenches for many years. Um, I'm essentially adding on, you know, work that's been done by Dr. Joy DeGru, work that's been done by Maria Braveheart, um, work that's been done by my, my dear friend and colleague, Anna Ortega Williams, um, work that's been done by uh, folks who really we're committed to helping us as, as black and brown people understand our relationship um, to this, this country, our relationship to white supremacy, um, to, to help us have a better historical framework um, to understand how our behaviors um, emerge from our interaction with these systems of oppression or with structural violence that has denied us um, access to the resources that we need, um, the basic needs um, have been denied, uh, which is essentially harm, right? And so even when we think about um, structural violence um, and as opposed to, you know, just like more of an inter or interpersonal violence, we just think about how these systems have historically been created based on an ideology of white supremacy, assuming the inferiority of black and brown folks and therefore us being uh, undeserving of basic resources. Um, and so, you know, I, I have to start by acknowledging the pioneers, acknowledging the people who put many years into it. Um, I'm fortunate to have been able to sit at the foot of some of these folks and just listen um, humbly and hear um, and then figure out how I can pass my, you know, the baton could be passed on to me or I can continue um, to share the messages and the information that they work so vigilantly to, to unearth for the liberation of black people, right? Um, for the liberation of all oppressed people. That starts with an awareness that something is not wrong with you, that historically something has happened to you. And it's happened to you in a way that uh, oftentimes we don't see it um, unless we have an analysis and a historical framing of how those systems have harmed us in a way that I just described. Um, and so when you even think about this whole concept of pathology and pathologizing, um, you know, it's essentially just saying that, you know, there's something wrong with people, right? Like when you pathologize, it's like there's something abnormal about people, right? Um, medically or psychologically, right? Um, and so when you look at the history of, of slavery, when you look at the history of Jim Crow, when you look at the history of all history of anti-Blackness, you see that there's a tremendous amount of trauma that we have endured. Um, the something that has happened to us has been that those traumatic experiences, right? Um, to the extent that we know, like, even with, even with, you know, like if we take the, the the, the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, right, into consideration and look at those symptoms, like the hypervigilance, the hyperarousal, right, the, the you know, the, the fear of, of life not lasting and all of these things that, that are associated with an actual uh, diagnosis and the symptomatology of post-traumatic stress disorder. And we add, right, and I'm not the first to say this, many people have said this for black and brown folks, it's not pulse for us, it's complex because it's consistent, right? So yes, we've experienced this historical um, trauma um, in the form of, of slavery, in the form of 
um, Jim Crow and lynching and anti-Blackness, um, but we also continue to experience it even to this day. Um, I was just listening to um, the young sister who gave her testimony in, um, in the trial against the cop who murdered um, George Floyd. And I was just thinking that how this sister had to witness that. And not only her, but like her nine-year-old uh, nine year uh, sister witnessed um, this, this man's life being taken in front of her, um, which is no different from witnessing the lynchings that happened, um, right? Which is no different from, you know, witnessing, you know, communities being demolished by this quote unquote criminal legal system that's rooted in white supremacy that intentionally targets black and brown community that exploits and capitalizes off of the suffering that they produce through the immense amount of trauma that they've exposed us to in which our behaviors are essentially uh, sim symptoms of PTSD or complex traumatic stress disorder, disorder or as Dr. Joy DeGru says, post-traumatic slave syndrome, right? Um, but it becomes pathologized in a way that leaves us vulnerable and op open for it to be um, not only pathologized, but criminalized. And then even in some instances destroyed, right? And so the way that the brother George Floyd responded, right? That they felt that they could destroy or take this man life, take his life is an example of that. The way that they felt that they could take the life of Breonna Taylor, that they can take the lives of so many of our people um, is rooted in this belief that we are dehumanized, that we are less than human, right? And so I talk about like the historical dehumanization of black and brown people that sets the precedent for them to treat us the way that we do. And which sadly, you know, they're black and brown people if you just, you know, just understand and internalize oppression that we can essentially become complicit in this process. It's also, uh, it's also driven by the fact that we may not have uh, analysis of how these structures and how these systems play, play out in our lives and how they influence our everyday individual behaviors in ways that it might seem like something is wrong with us, but essentially something has happened to us. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about pathologizing black and um, indigenous people of colors, um, trauma responses, it's just that, right? It's just recognizing that something has happened to us collectively, um, something that happened to us historically um, that has caused us to experience these same situation um, of trauma, these same symptoms of trauma. Um, and then if you take into consideration uh, epigenetics, right? And like how we know that like subsequent generations can have a similar type of experience of traumatization, even if they weren't exposed to the primary trauma. And right, and like epi just means it's just like above. So it doesn't change the genetic coding, but it does have an impact. When you think of epi, you think on or on something. It just has an impact on the genetic coding of, of people who previously, uh, who are the descendants of those who previously experienced that primary trauma. And so it's not a coincidence that our bodies respond um, symptomatically in ways like we are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder or complex traumatic stress disorder, even though we didn't experience that. And so you couple it, right? Taking into consideration po complex post-traumatic stress disorder, that it's a consistent, it's a constant. Um, and then when we respond um, in that way, those behaviors are then labeled, right? Labeled um, in ways that allow the criminal legal system to gobble us up, um, you know, to continue to dehumanize us, criminalize us, and in the, in the case of so many of our people, even destroy us. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop right there. Um, but, you know, I, I actually, you know, I want to add one thing too. I think um, just really considering like what's, what's needed. Um, and it's important for us, those of us who are educators, who are social workers, who are therapists, who are advocates, um, for us to have, you know, we, we, we get, we get our, our clinical training, we get the knowledge that we need to understand like learning styles and how to educate and teach. Um, we get all of this information, um, but oftentimes it's, it's void of a systems analysis, it's void of an analysis of the ways of systems of oppression, 
um, impact the individuals that we're working with directly. And if we don't have that analysis, inevitably it can result in us blaming the victims, right? Or blaming the people who are simply responding to the harm that has happened to them, right? And so we have to have this analysis. That's why this organizing work is so important because not only do we wanna help people heal on an individual level, we wanna heal collectively by exposing this historical narrative, by exposing the historical and collective trauma that we've experienced to help people understand collectively that there's nothing innately or naturally wrong with you as black and brown people, but something has happened to you, black and brown people, that has caused tremendous harm and that continues to live in our bodies. But then more importantly than that, that despite all of these things that we've experienced, that there's something tremendously great about us and there's something right about us. And even in regards, even as a, you know, after experiencing all of that, we're able to produce some amazing things. We're able to live in a world with compassion, right? You know, one of my friends say that black and brown people are the model citizens of the planet. And I believe it because there's no other group that has experienced the amount of pain and trauma and harm and genocidal attacks as we have and still live in the world and exist in the world in a way that we're compassionate, forgiving, and hopeful. So. Thank you so much for that, Richard. <clears throat> you see, this is the whole, you know, this is kind of the reason why we put together this webinar because we wanted you all to, to like meet the people on staff who do this work every day. And um, these are conversations that we have around the office every day, just getting up and going to the kitchen, well, before COVID, uh, in, in before COVID times, just meeting in the kitchen and having conversations like this. And so we really wanted to share that with everyone. Um, and before I shift it to Marjorie, um, I wanna answer one really important question that I saw in the chat um, from Michelle Garcia. Uh, and Marjorie, if you could answer this, because you're a senior trauma support manager, I feel like you're the most capable of answering this question. Um, uh, how do you address individuals who have experienced harm, but do not embrace the term survivor because they do not feel it reflects where they are in their healing process? Um, so thank you so much, Michelle, for that question. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that question so much. And I'm, I'm glad to have an opportunity to speak to it. Um, I'm also just like, whew, listening to Richard and Kira and Emil say, I like, I'm having the physical experience listening to you three speak, um, just of like the brilliance in this webinar right now. So thank you all for, for that. Um, yeah, I'll start by speaking to, to the language we use. And um, I'm just scrolling in my chat to find this exact question. You know, I think a lot of what we talk about at Common Justice and, and the way we practice in, in the trauma support department, we're working specifically with people who are, uh, who come to us as harmed parties. So a lot of this labeling sort of impacts the way people come to us and the way systems see them. And the way I work with people one-on-one -on -one and, and sort of the way common justice works with people as we interact with them throughout the, the life of their involvement with us, people define themselves entirely. You know, people define themselves who they are and where they are in their healing process. Um, and something I think about a lot is that like healed is not a place you arrive. You know, survivor is not a place you arrive. It is, for some people, it's a journey. For some people, it's a roller coaster. For some people, it's an analogy that I can't even come up with the language for, which is like part of the brilliance and beauty of, of resilience, you know, and of like what Richard named, like the ability to have compassion and be forgiving and be hopeful. I'm like, you know, taking notes as he's talking, writing these words down because I think it's just the exact way to put it. Um, so I think the term, the terminology that we're talking about here is so useful in terms of systemic change and in terms of like shifting oppressive systems. And at the same time, if someone comes to comes to us and identifies as a victim, we see them as a victim. You know, that's who they are. And, and it's never my place, our place, anyone's place to define for someone who they are. And I think, in fact, that's the exact oppressive norm that, that these systems sort of live into and, and I welcome you know anyone else who who has thoughts on that on this panel to to jump in but that that's my first thought
Yeah, thank you for that, Marjorie. Um, and the question I wanted to ask you originally, which might lead to more to more questions and maybe might address some of the questions in the chat, is, you know, as a trauma support manager, you get to see firsthand what trauma support looks like for both our harmed parties and our responsible parties. Can you describe some of the overlaps between each party, um, between their needs and what restorative justice process, what the restorative justice process provides for them? Yeah. Yeah, the overlaps between responsible parties and harmed parties and, and what, um, what restorative justice offers. Um, I think, you know, there's, um, sorry, I'm just getting to the right place in my notes here to make sure I say everything I want to say. Um, yeah, in terms of like what, what does support look like for harmed and responsible parties? The answer sometimes feels so simple. Like they can be the same person. They can be the same person on the day they come to me. They can be, uh, or they come to common justice or the day I come to them, you know, they can be someone can be harmed and responsible in the course of a week. And sometimes it's just a matter, the, the difference is like the day of the week that they have criminal just they interact with the criminal justice system, with police, with systems, um, which, which I think goes back to what Kira was saying of like mandatory arrests. Like who, who are they arresting? It's the person who someone, who, who the cop thinks is arrestable in that moment for whatever reason. And we know that that is not made on like arbitrary that, that's not made from a like a objective view. It's made with systemic racism, with so many things uh, impacting that. Um, and I think something that Danielle says is like, there's no no one has a monopoly on harm. Nobody is only harmed. And and I think that's true on a micro level up to like a huge the biggest systems level. Like nobody is just one thing. So when when it's the question of like what's similar about harmed and responsible parties, it's everything. They're people, they're people who have various experiences and the context in which they're working with us is what's different. Like what, what brings you through the door here? Um, and we often have people who come to us as responsible parties and end up working with the trauma support manager, someone in the response, in the harmed party side of the work because they're experiencing violence, they're experiencing systemic violence, interpersonal violence. Um, and I think removing that lens of like, you're one or the other really allows us to meet people's needs, which kind of comes to the second part of your question, and you'll say, which is, what does the restorative justice process provide? And I think it, it does many things, but one of the most important things in this particular context is that it allows those who are harmed to define what repair looks like. So I think when you zoom out again, this is a very simple notion. It can't be up to a, a faceless or nameless system to decide what repair looks like. Um, and we know that prison isn't what repair looks like. Um, again, like Danielle says, drivers of violence are the same drivers of, or the same core features of prisons. Um, so what restorative justice offers you know, throughout the whole process, which is not just sitting down for a circle, like it's months and months and months of work and, and processing and sometimes, a, you know, a lifetime even of work. But what it allows is space to say, what do you need and what do you want? And sometimes people will say, I have no idea what I need or want. And so what we do is we process and we sit together and we think together um, about what healing could look like. You know, we allow room for imagination to be creative and to dream what healing and safety could look like. And I think we recognize there's no end goal. Like I said, like healing is in a place that you arrive. Um, and I'm gonna say one of my favorite one-liners again from Richard, which is like the opposite of trauma isn't healing, it's power. And what we do is we are able to give people power and agency over what healing can be for them. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'm gonna address a couple of the questions um, that were dropped in the chat and in the Q&A. Uh, thank you all for being so patient and for asking such wonderful questions. Um, uh, Kira, I'm going to ask you this question um, before we sh shift over to Shuai. Um, This is from Cecilia Ramirez. Uh, the White House just announced that they are dedicating 
$55 billion over eight years to community-based violence prevention programs. How do you think this will contribute to shifting the narrative around violence and from an infrastructure perspective, how should our movement ready ourselves to receive what may be transformational governmental support for the first time in history? And what are the risks? Um, yeah, I mean, I, so this is, so that's actually um, great news. And I think that like, one way that our communities can ready ourselves is kind of like having conversations like this, basically. That's like talking about the needs for like um, the services that we're asking for, mental health services, alternative to incarceration um, programs, restorative justice programs. Um, I think it's like, it's really important to get the conversation out there about um, violence and why violence exists in our um, community. Like one thing I was thinking about when, um, when Marjorie was talking about was like the, some of the core drivers of violence, like common justice, we say like the core drivers of violence is shame, um, isolation, inability to meet one's economic needs and exposure to, um, to violence. And interestingly um, enough, like this really um, sad and emotional and complex conversation that we're having as a nation uh, now around like the violence against the Asian community. And some of that violence has been perpetrated um, by, by black folks, right? So this is like, this is like a conversation we never had before in our nation. And I know like, you know, me and some of my colleagues were talking about like why that is actually happening. We were saying, well, can you actually look at those four drivers and, and say, this is, they actually um, speak to what's happening with the anti-Asian violence and perpetrated by, by um, Black folks, and maybe not all of them, they don't always happen to, together, but as Richard was saying, like, just the fact that, like, Black folks have, but ex have been exposed to so much violence, I think, and people don't really, can't really get their heads around what that looks like, but that exposure to violence that goes back to slavery um, has a huge impact on our communities, and I think that uh, understanding of that would help people forgive, understand, hold people accountable, but still like find it in their hearts to somehow forgive folks who are committing that violence. And I think about my own like personal story with around violence um, and around race. And I remember when I was like in my twenties and I was like so upset about everything that was happening to black people. And I remember hearing this, this black woman facilitator talk, it was like a group called Beyond Diversity 101. And she was trying to bring white and black people together. And she said the most violent acts that happened to her happened to her by people in her own family. And that was like an aha moment for me because the most violent acts that happened to me happened to me from people in my own family. And I was always railing against the system because I had an analysis that helped me understand that the reason that they were doing what they were doing is because of all the violence and oppression that they face in their lives, um, abuse, um, poverty, which is like state violence and all the discrimination and all the indignities, which actually led to them treating the, me the way that they treated me, right? And the ripple effects I still feel to this day, you know, I'm still healing, I'm still going to therapists. But if someone asked me if I wanted to see those people punished, of course I wouldn't want to see those punished. This is my family. I, I still love the people who harm me the most, right? So Black people have a very um, complex um, analysis. And, and also we have been very patterned to forgive. I've had forgiven and forgiven and forgiven, right? So I'm very quick to forgive. So like, so having that analysis, when we're talking about violence in um, our communities, we will be quick to say that we don't think people should be punished. I remember when I was doing, when I was in um, in my 30s and I was doing this restorative um, justice work, it was like a, it wasn't a real restorative justice program in the sense of common justices, restorative justice program, but I was working with youth who actually um, did harm. And this one particular young guy who was like 16, he said that he, he, he was in this program because he um, set his house on fire. And he actually said that he was a, a victim of rape when he was younger by a man who raped him. And I said, you know, wh what would you want to happen to that man? And he said, um, at first I was really angry and I wanted to put a gun through his, a, a bullet through his head. He said, but then when I thought about it, I was like, something must have horrible must have happened to him to make him do that to me. So I feel like 
going back to the question, um, with all of this money that's coming in our communities, I think that we need to really use it in ways that's really going to call for transformative justice. And I think for everyone to be on board with those with that um, call, then I think that there's a real need to understand why violence happens in our communities and what is going to get to the root causes of it, which is something that looks nothing like the carceral state. So I think that like, you know, just by having the people who have been directly impacted by having survivors that we're saying people heavily impacted by oppression, just like talk about what putting, ask us what needs to be done with that money and we'll tell you, right? And if you don't understand like the core drivers of violence or, or, or all of these complex things that we're talking about, um, in this conversation, then you, then maybe you shouldn't be at the table, you know, have us at the table, basically. Um, so I'm glad that, you know, we're having these conversations. I'm glad that the Black Lives Matter movement has like pushed us to the point where, you know, we are having these really complex conversations. I, and um, yeah, and I just hope that like, the people most impacted are the ones who decide how that money is used. Thank you so much, Kira. Uh, and I think that is a uh, beautiful segue. And before, there's some really powerful questions in the Q&A and, and some comments in the chat, which we'll address in a second. But I really want to get to Schweib, who has been waiting patiently <clears throat> for me to introduce him. Um, and I think everything Kira just said is a beautiful segue to, to Schweib. Um, and so the question I have for you, Schweib, is you know, you're a formerly incarcerated person yourself. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how being first a harmed party led you to your own incarceration and then to this work? You're muted, Schweb. I had it all been muted for so long, I forgot to cut it off. Uh, thank you, Milsey, for the introduction. Um, To speak to my being a harm party is using the same type of language and analysis that Kira laid out very clearly and also spoken to by Richard. And that is, first of all, that the system doesn't see you or people of color as being a victim in the first place. And so when my family had been um, threatened and I had been threatened personally, by a group of people, very violent people, and being part of a faith community, I was advised to report it to the police. Uh, and I did. Uh, they uh, trivialized the matter, felt it was insignificant, uh, didn't really understand the core issues because it something that took place within the community of color. And so, it, being in that harm state, being in the threatened state, you know, I then acted out of fear and committed an act to, in order to obtain weapons to defend myself and my family. And that led to a confrontation, of course, and spiraled out of control with law enforcement. Innocent people were injured and affected. An innocent person, a law enforcement officer lost his life. I spent 37 and a half years in prison reflecting upon my actions. It is a very painful process for anyone who is first a, a harm party, but then being blinded by their uh, powerlessness, being unable to receive the help and assistance from a system that didn't understand that I was a harm party. And now finding myself being a person who's responsible for harming other people is not a comfortable pos uh, position to be in. I lived in that state for 37 years. I still live in it, being home now. And it was while I was locked up in prison that I came to realize that I wasn't alone. Hurt people hurt people. That is the premise of understanding the cycle of violence is that People who commit violence are often have survivors of violence. And in prison, the prisons are loaded with people who are harmed parties, but now have become responsible parties, being responsible for harming another through acts of violence, mostly in defense of themselves or with a survival 
And so being in that place and running out of the excuses and all of the arguments about the system and justice, the lawyers and this, that, and the appeal process, it really came down to being facing myself as a human being. And that was a painful process of me going back through my life and understanding where I was, how I got to be in that place to make a bad decision, one that I, I regret and will continue to regret. And so while I was still locked up I, I, and, and being in a position where I was a spiritual leader over several hundred men and having to hear their struggles and coming to terms with themselves and the things that they've done and why they have done them. I had to be in a position to help them get through a healing process or start a healing process and understanding that we are responsible for harming others. And what can we do now to try to eradicate those elements of harm that we experienced that led to us becoming responsible parties? And so in coming home, even before then, it's when I came into contact with restorative justice. And someone passed me a book. I read it by, I said, whoa, it resonated, bells went off. I said, oh, wow, being a person of faith, of course, I've seen a way and a route for us to be able to come together. And I say by us, I mean all of the harm parties within my faith community and outside of it. And I, you know, I was uh, uh, in a leadership position and in, in, in a position to be able to create a, an organization. And this organization behind the prison walls in Shawanga, one of the maximum security prisons in the state of New York, you know, we started a restorative justice subcommittee of the lifers and long-termers. And it was there that I began to see what restorative justice could look like. But of course, the systems were not in place to allow that. And of course, that coming home and uh, of course, searching for a way to be able to continue the work I was doing inside, I was fortunate to hear about common justice and very fortunate and blessed to be here in this space to be able to walk this road helping people who have been harmed as a trauma support manager you know seeing what that harm looks like and understanding where they are right now and of course to help them to understand having been there where they were before i became a responsible party of that to be that support system for them and this is to me is the most rewarding work is helping people who have been harmed to find solutions to their life, solutions to being able to, uh, to respond to the, to, to the harm and looking at harm from a different perspective, a broader perspective, a systemic perspective, an institutional perspective, understanding how racism, how white supremacy, all of this has shaped and molded the society in which, within which we live. Restorative justice is not just an experiment, it's an alternative. And it's an ancient alternative. It's one that's been applied everywhere in the world where the indigenous people who come together in smaller communities and tribal societies, understanding how to resolve conflicts. You know, prison is not the answer. It's not the solution. It's not the healing. Sort of justice is the way for us to begin to take that journey. And I'm part of it, both on a personal level and also proud to be part of the effort in supporting those who have been harmed that come to us in common justice. That's beautiful. <clears throat> Thank you, Shuad. Um, what I'm gonna address uh, as a person in the communications department, a couple of the comments that I've seen in the chat and, and in the Q and A, because I think it's really important and I don't wanna ignore them. Um, some people, you know, don't really understand why we choose the term survivor or still feel that there's times where the term victim is preferable. And if you all wanna unmute yourselves and chime in at any moment, please, uh, you're more than welcome to. But from my understanding um, is that the term victim doesn't have any power. There is a lack of power there that a lot of people and a lot of people of color don't see themselves as victims of, of violence, right? Even though they, they are. Um, all people of color living in the United States are victims of violence. Um, 
but because they have been in positions of powerlessness for so long, they do not want to identify with something that they see as having no power. Um, so that is why we use the term survivor, because we want people of color to know that they have survived violence and they are surviving, that they, if they are here today, they have survived a tremendous amount of violence. Um, and so we, we don't reject the terms victim. There are times where absolutely it is, it is you know, um, someone made the point, what if someone was murdered uh, by a white supremacist? Absolutely, that person was a victim of violence, but we also, the term survivor, I feel like allows us to also see that that community, that person's family members, even the person who caused that harm, because I mean, unless you're a completely soulless person, that has to have some sort of impact on you. I would hope this is me being an optimistic person, um, but it's a lot more encompassing of, of people and the trauma that they experience than I, I feel that the term victim is. So that is why we as an organization use the term survivor, um, but Richard, Kira, Schweib, Marjorie, let me know what you all think. I think what what I'm thinking is, as I hear you talk, I'm going to say it's like the historical connotation of the term victim, um, you know, and what that's always meant, which is meant like someone who looks like me, a white woman. And the term with survivor, like we're getting it at something bigger, something something more than that. And I'll name that, you know, some people come to us identifying as victims. And again, that's who they are. Like we are not telling anyone who they are. Some people come to us as just people who something, you know, really messed up happened to. I had to catch myself there to keep my language professional. Um, some people come to us as people who have survived harm, experienced harm, lived through harm. You know, there's, and I think the term survivor or at least moving away from the term victim, just expand, like it says, there's so much more there. It's not this narrow thing. It's not just a few people who have access to resources. Yeah, the only thing, I mean, I think that you you both nailed it. Only thing I would add to that is like, just back to what I said earlier, like we use survivors way to move away from victim, not saying we should never use the term victim, but as a way to move away from victim, which has also historically um, been used by the criminal legal system and has been um, used in the way to have caused like more um, survivors, led to more survivors because it caused more people to be um, in prison and also, and that's huge for us as an organization to like just push away um, and ask for society to do away with the carceral state because as a government puts more and more money in the carceral state at the same time, it's like taking take more and more money away from communities who can actually and need that money. And, and I think someone said in the chat, like what the government's giving right now is not enough money at all for the, the healing that we need and deserve, especially because all the historical trauma we've been talking about. But like, so, so everything we do as an organization is really about like, um, ending mass incarceration and moving away from the carceral state. And on top of that, we think that's really important to do because we think those resources need to be put back into our community. And when those put that money's put back into our communities, we get the type of healing that we need. So that's another reason we move away from the term victim. Uh, and, and I would I would add too, like, you know, one of the things that, I, that I've always said is like, you know, black and brown people have never had the opportunity to be victims, right? Um, in addition to like the, the powerlessness that it, it connotes, right? Um, the fact is that we've always had to fight and survive and move forward. There was no time, there was no space, there was no opportunity to be a victim to the extent that we even said it to each other, right? Because we internalized, we like, we gotta be strong because victim you know, suggested that there was weakness. We gotta, we gotta be strong. But I think it's imperative that we acknowledge that we have been, we are victims and we have been victimized by these systems. I think these are two fronts. One is a, is a politicized effort that we're looking to do to, 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 to galvanize people who have, who are victims, who've experienced harm. 
not just interpersonal harm too. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. Like there's systemic harm, there's structural violence that we continue to experience, right? And that's the more nuanced, complex aspect of, of the expansion of violence for black and brown people. Um, but we definitely also have been victims and we need to accept that. You know, um, I'm also a formerly incarcerated person, I'm a survivor of gun violence, I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. Um, and it was nearly impossible for me to stay and think about myself as a victim, right? Um, because all of the things that I had internalized about this hyper-masculinity, there was indeed racist in nature, right? That, that Black men were like, we were more prone to be perpetrators of violence, least likely to experience violence, right? Definitely not vulnerable, not susceptible to experiencing harm, right? We got, you know, documented information, like positioned, and, if you ever have a chance, read the book Medical Apartheid and talk about how there's a belief that we have the capacity to sustain and experience harm at higher levels uh, because, again, going back to this notion that we are subhuman um, and therefore capable of withstanding and experiencing harm in ways that no other group has. So all of these things have contributed to, to our experience of, of, of victimization and, and our uh, unwillingness to even say it because I had to keep going. I couldn't be in prison thinking like a victim, right? I couldn't be in a community where all of us were victims of structural violence and surviving the way that we knew how based on the resources and the information that we had, right? And be a victim. And so when someone says you're a victim, I quickly denounced that. But today I realize I am a victim, right? I have been a victim, but I'm also surviving. So I believe that we can we can be both, right? We can be a victim and a survivor, right? Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I just want to uh, comment to um, the five billion dollars that the White House is now um, uh, designated towards uh, violence and addressing violence in the communities. This is the monies that credible messengers around the country have been asking for. I'm a credible messenger, Rich is a credible messenger. You know, we're credible in the sense that we come from a situation where we can relate to much of the violence that's going on in the community, we understand it. And we are more, more able to be able to go in and to be able to interrupt those instances of violence before they even occur, or to lead people down a path towards healing and reconciliation that will prevent violence from reoccurring. And so this kind of work that's being done, mostly by volunteers, you know, uh, it, these are unpaid people, uh, workers out there in the street every day in every urban community around America. You know, you have credible messengers working in various organizations by different names, but also incorporating and using the same types of tools of listening, understanding, communicating, you know, trying to reconcile differences you know, which is all part of a, an extension of restorative justice type of thinking, you know, where you try to get out in front of a situation before it occurs. These are some very brave men and women and people of color in our communities who are doing this work and they're not being added, they're not being paid for it. They should be paid for it. You know, many of them are doing it on their own, getting up in the middle of the night, they hear gunshots, most people run and hide up under the, under the bed. They put on their clothes and run out in the street and they try to find out who's at it, what the situation is about, who was involved. They run into the hospitals, standing by the bedsides of, of, of people who have laying there bleeding out, listening to police, trying to interrogate them, you know, wanting immediate information about what, what occurred and what just went on. When their real primary concern is to understand the cause, which they're not going to get from law enforcement. People in the community who live there, these credible messengers are very important to stemming the violence, preventing the violence, or things could be a lot worse. They're responsible for the, for the decrease in the violence and the decrease within the gun violence in these communities, and they need to be supported. So this $5 billion should go to them, should go to these organizations and others like that to support them in this work. This is valuable work you know, that is very, very much needed and to reward those people who are out there giving much of their lives, the unsung heroes, you know, again, these are all credible messengers. Many of them or most of them were formerly incarcerated and like myself and like Richard, we've come out here to do this work. This is our way of doing sorry, 
not just being sorry or saying sorry, but doing sorry. And these are the credible messengers work network that's going on in this community throughout the country. So that's where that money is targeted for, and that's where it should go. But we know how things happen you know, politically. It starts at five billion. By the time it gets to the community, they'll be probably be paying these workers minimum wage. But that's not. Uh, uh, but that's the thought behind it. That was the whole process, the movement to get that funding in the first place. I just want to make that comment clear because I understand what it's about. <clears throat> thank you so much, Schwab. Um, and thank you all for your uh, um, amazing questions. I'm going to try to answer, try to get to them all. Um, and this one by Anonymous, if you would like to tell us your name, because I think it's a really great question, an, an amazing point to bring up. Um, Anonymous says, thank you for bringing up the killing of George Floyd. Uh, this is where my brain tends to hit a wall. Imagining a world without wildly different ways of responding to people who cause extraordinary harm feels most difficult when I consider Derek Chauvin and the other Derek Chauvins in our world. I look forward to your insights. Yeah, I mean, whew, that's, that's a hard one. Um, I think, I'm not the best person to answer this question because I work in communications. I don't work in direct service or in policy, but <clears throat> um, I think one of the key, one of our key pillars here at Common Justice, um, and the first one, I think in the most important one, I, I think is um, accountability. We, there is no accountability. Um, in the police force. Um, that, that's the first thing that needs to happen. Um, so whatever accountability, accountability, real accountability looks like in this case is what needs to happen. Um, and we need to change this culture of protecting um, the police when they cause harm because no other person no CEO of any multi-million dollar industry can murder someone in broad daylight and get away with it. Possibly they could, but not if it's on video. Um, I mean, they probably could pay enough to, to, to go to one of the, one of the fancy, one of the fancier uh, prisons. But I mean, I think we, we need to start there with accountability and holding everyone accountable equally, which we have not done. Um, and one of the things that that I'm that I see a lot right now as well is like the way that the decriminalization process has been happening, where you have a lot of white men making millions of dollars off an industry that incarcerated black and brown people, um, which I think is also wrong. So how do we create these alternative to incarceration programs, these restorative justice based programs? that won't just repeat this pattern of benefiting white people at the end of the day. Um, but I I'll let Richard and Schwab and Kira and Marjorie uh, try to answer, answer that question. Uh, <laughs> restorative justice, it can't be something that we can think only applies to one set of people. Restorative justice applies to everyone. Uh, the officer who is responsible for killing George Floyd has no accountability. He doesn't think he did anything wrong. His position then, at the moment, he was carrying out his act for the world to see. He was operating in a very comfortable place. You can see by his reaction that he didn't think he was doing anything thing wrong. This is what needs to be changed. This notion, this idea that it is okay for someone to place their knee upon another person's neck and think that it's okay for whatever reason. And not understanding the consequences of what he has done when the person, the, the officer who killed George Floyd comes to that 
reality. And I believe as a human being, I hope and pray that he, beneath all of this white supremacist privilege that he has, and that's what he is, he's living in this place. Uh, one of my colleagues said very succinctly, she said a white supremacist doesn't see racism because it's like a fish in water. It doesn't see the water because it's all around him. And this guy, Chauvin, you can see, he, he didn't think he did anything wrong. This is what we have to attack. This is what we have to change. He has to change. I wouldn't advocate prison for anybody. I've been there. The ultimate thing, we have to correct his thinking. We have to correct the thinking of those like him and create an alternative for him to be able to repay, to repair the damage that he has done to another human being and to see the people around him as human. Whatever that takes, whatever that would look like, I'm not saying I got the picture in my mind, I just know and believe that restorative justice applies to everyone. That if we're gonna eradicate prison it has to be eradicated for everyone. And with that, I mean, I'm just saying, we, we don't necessarily wanna begin with Charles because there's so many other deserving people that don't deserve to be in prison right now. They should be home. But I'm saying the ultimate goal is to eradicate this, to erase this. And I'm not saying that, you know, prison is, is the best solution for him either. I'm just letting you know that we have to correct his thinking and the, and the environment within which he came out of to think that it's okay to do what he did. That's restorative justice. Until that's done, the work has just begun. And I also want to add like something that that I think comes up a lot when we explain what our program is, which is accountability is not forgiveness. You know, you don't have to forgive someone in order for them to be accountable for the harm they caused. And um, and I think there's, you know, there's a maybe a thought that restorative justice it is the easy way out. Like it, it's not, prisons don't require people to be accountable. Processes like restorative and transformative justice do. And accountability is not, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's a human experience to sort of shudder at the idea of being accountable to harm, especially when you sit with the impact of that harm. When you know that your harm, that, that harm that you caused like, really impacted someone you know so similar to what Shuai was saying it's not it's not just about um one person it's about the system that they come from and and the world that allows for somebody you know for policing and prisons to operate the way it does you know it, it's it's so much there's so much there I mean yeah I'll stop there and I'll, I'll yeah this is all so on point, and both Margie and Shuap said something I wanted to um, touch upon, but I'll just touch upon what Shuap said. I mean, I think that like, you know, why do we have police? I mean, the, the whole system of policing is um, is a problematic. And we know that the systems, um, you know, stem from like white slave catchers, like, you know, going after um, black folks who were considered um, property. And one of my favorite books by um, Resma um, Minicum, who's like uh, my grandmother's hands, where he talks about like racialized trauma and epigenetics. And he just doesn't talk about it as far as epigenetics as it impacts black people. He talks about how it impacts white people. He says for like white people, like imagine someone, he talked about doing um, slavery and he talked about this one scene that he read about where a white person considered a master was, talking to a black person, consider a slave in a, in a horrible way that like, just was, you know, just, he was talking to the black person as if he wasn't even human. And a lot of white people were in the room and they didn't say anything, they didn't do anything, they turned their heads. And he says, you know, how does that impact them? You know, they have to, they're constantly turning their heads to like seeing all these indignities and seeing all this violence against black people. How does that impact their children and their children, right? So like, you have these white people who are police officers in our communities and they're they're able to constantly turn their heads to violence as police officers towards us. And then Resma Minikim goes even further and he talks about like, 
epigenetics as it um as it applies to police officers and like and as they're like dealing with people in our communities the black and brown people who they see as inferior to them and if someone they see as inferior to them talks back to them they hold all that anger in them and they might take it out on the next person so it's just i mean i think that like a really um clear answer to that question is like the policing uh the the system of policing is a mess in itself. And, and, and Derek shouldn't even been in a situation where he was allowed to do that to George Floyd. Um, so I'll just, I'll leave that there. But then, I mean, I, I'll say one more thing to what Marge was saying. And as far as, um, you know, I mean, I do, so, but we're gonna have police, right? So we can't just get rid of the systems of policing altogether. So then if you just try to take a restorative justice approach, I think about the situation with um, Botham Jean, Jean, the guy who was killed by that white police officer um, in um, his house when she went into the wrong apartment. And, uh, and his um, brother, I believe it was, who actually said he wanted to forgive him. And a lot of people, I remember in the Black community was upset about that. But I think that like, um, you know, the restorative justice process, the victim should have a say in what happens to the person who caused the harm, you know? So if the brother wanted to, to forgive that white police officer, I think that should be um, taken into account, into consideration as well. And I'll say, I'll say quickly, like, um, that's the reason why transformative justice as well is important too, right? Because like we're talking about restorative justice on an individual level, on a community level, but we're still operating in these systems that are unjust, that are rooted in all these, these ideolo this ideology of white supremacy, patriarchy, all of these systems, these ideologies that influence the, the construction of these systems that perpetuate harm need to be changed. You know, um, even at Common Justice, we operate, we run a restorative justice, but we operating in a system that needs to be transformed. That's why it's so important um, for our TJ folks to really be a part of this conversation too, when we think about, you know, uh, the resources that are being, the government is gonna, you know, allocate towards community violence intervention uh, work. They need to be involved, because now how do we hold these systems accountable, right? How do we transform these systems that they're accountable for the harm that they're perpetuating? Having them confront, right, the harm that they've caused, because that's the key. Like what you were saying, Marjorie, like, like to confront, it's not easy to come face to face because you can do a brilliant bid, spend your whole time with a narrative in your head that justifies your behavior to a Shawad point that doesn't allow you to start to look at the reasoning why you were able to, to commit the act that you did, the harm that was caused to you that put you, you don't look at that. So we can't conflate punishment and accountability, right? You can do 37 years, right, Brother Shua? 37 years and never find yourself in a place where you are forced to be held accountable, where you confront all of those things, right? And so we know that that's not the answer. We know that's not solution. And so transformative justice needs to be a part of this conversation. Our TJ folks need to be a part of this, this conversation. And I think that's also very disheartening too, because oftentimes what I find is that we're, we're pitted against each other, right? TJ folks and RJ folks. And that's something that we need to do. And that's something that we also need to think about too. One of the things that's important for me is, is to realize that even those who do this work, we're still consistently being impacted. Right, so it's equally important for us to be consistently engaging in our own healing journey so that we don't find ourselves replicating these types of systems of harm in our own organizations and this work, because let's just face it, that's happening, right? Until we address it and we continue to be committed to supporting each other, this is the whole system, the idea of healing justice, right? And the importance of that, right, it's changing the world while simultaneously being equally committed to our own healing journey so that when this world becomes the one that we envision, we don't bring our old shit, and I curse, I'm sorry, Margie, we don't bring that into that space and find ourselves replicating the harm. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna address a question that's a really important question by Elliot Boutte, I hope I'm not butch butchering your last name. How has it worked for common justice getting buy-in from traditional legal folks like prosecutors and judges? Is it helpful to think about formalizing those in law? And what's the role of maintaining the stick or threat of returning to the traditional system? I don't wanna maintain punishment as an option, but when I think of trying to implement things like common justice in our own communities, 
those are the obvious questions and pushbacks we'll get. Yes, very obvious. Those are the questions and the pushbacks we get. We get criticized all the time for that, all of the time. <clears throat> We're either being too lenient to the people who are in our program um, or we're over cops, right? Um, and that's just something, and, and I'm speaking to this because as a communications person, this is what I see, um, people, the criticisms that I see from people um, on social media, um, people who criticize us publicly. Uh, and, I, and I understand that, right? Because why, <clears throat> I wish we were, I think we all wish everyone here on this panel um, and everyone at our organization wishes that we could provide this without having to have any kind of relationship with the criminal legal system. But that is not where we're at as a country. So we have to meet people where they're at in order to do this work. And as painful as it may sound to some people, as unacceptable as that may sound, that's just the reality. You know, change doesn't come overnight. Sometimes you have to meet people where they're at and it's incremental. You know, we're, we're doing this incremental change. Um, so that's that's how I see it. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let the others on the panel um, address that question as well. You know, common justice, we, we're engaged with people who are prosecutors, like for instance, prosecutor in, in uh, Kings County, Brooklyn, they're already at that place where they see that incarceration is not the real answer or solution. There are several judges, now I just, I can only speak for here in, in New York, but I know they exist around the country, have come to realize that incarceration, of course, is not the, the panacea for all ills, you know what I'm saying, the panacea for all ills, and that there has to be another solution. They're open. Restorative justice the message, the model of restorative justice is being spoken about in you know, universities and colleges of law out of which prosecutors and judges are coming to the bench. Progressives, yes, they are progressive. They're willing to go out on the limb to give it a try. And here in Brooklyn, you know, in Kings County, you know, the prosecutors here and, and the judges in the Brooklyn Supreme Court in some most violent cases from assault all up to murder. They're looking at other solutions. And of course, the person who's harmed has to always be at the center because of the work that we do is centered around harm parties. And when the harm parties, and most of them don't really agree that prison is the solution. Some of them do, but most of them don't. And you'll be surprised in what some of the cases that they are. And so they're willing to look at an alternative way in order to get at that thing, that sense of security and peace in the community. Remember, the objective of restorative justice is to restore the peace and the harmony in the community. The peace and the harmony. Look, look, look at the tribal system. They've dealt with things such as murder, even child abuse I've seen in, in some of the comments. Native American communities who, who are, who are, are, are uh, a, a lockstep with restorative justice as part of their cultural heritage. They address all of these issues all of the time. You know, how they do it is something that you know, a lot of people just can't wrap their head around because some of these instances are so, uh, uh, you know, so tragic. But nonetheless, they, they confront them. Country, uh, 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 and, and indigenous communities in Africa and Latin America, they've been dealing with this for centuries using a restorative justice model. They didn't have prisons. And these are people who they knew in their home, their families. And they were able to restore the peace and the harmony within that village, within that community by using restorative justice. This is how we have to start thinking. You know, prison is not the only solution. And in fact, it is no solution at all. What we have to do is prison doesn't make us safe and secure. It's people make us safe and secure, communicating with each other, resolving the issues, the underlying causes and issues, getting the person to be accountable for what they've done, doing sorry, figuring out what that looks like in individual cases. There's no one thing that fits every, every, you know, every situation has to define for itself what that looks like. 
but you have to at least walk the path. You at least got to start the process. You got to start the conversation or it'll never take place. If you're just gonna put a harm parties or victims on one side of a barrier in a courtroom and then the responsible party or the perpetrator on the other side, and then you got a judge and prosecutor who sits in between them and then they can't talk to each other. In fact, they just want to determine, did you do it? Okay, you did it, all right, this is the punishment. And they send you in, that's supposed to be the cure. The victim is never consulted. They don't have any say in the process. They don't even know till years later, the person comes up a row. Oh my God, he's coming home. They were living in that state of fear because no one has reached out to them. No one has helped them. No one has talked to them. No one has given them any assurances that they are safe and will be safe, that this person is no longer a threat or a danger, that this person has accepted. None of those conversations don't take place in this system. That's what's wrong with it. That's what's wrong with it. And so, you know, restorative justice is an alternative. We all need to sit back and just think back to where our ancestors, how did they resolve these problems? You think that what we're dealing with now, crimes and violence, theft, uh, uh, assault, murders, uh, uh, abuse is new? No, this has been going on for centuries. How did they resolve it back then before the colonizers came? Before imperialism came? Before we all became colonized and subjected to a foreign system that didn't work in Europe and the damn sure ain't working over here. It's causing more harm than it's doing anything else. So we need to look at it and say, hold up, you know, let us resolve it. And this is where common justice comes in. And we're taking a very, you know, out on the limb because we're dealing with the violent cases. Most restorative justice programs deal with nonviolent crimes. Yeah, it's easy to resolve. You jumped over a turnstile, you know, okay, you sit down talk. You know, you're assaulted. You know, even in schools, you know, they have a little restorative justice circles. You know, that's fine. Trust me. That's right. I'm not, you know, be ready. But what are you doing in the most serious cases? This is where the most harm is done. And, you know, to the benefit and credit of the, the, the prosecutors here in, in New York City uh, and some of the judges is on the bench. All of them ain't bought into it. You know, all the prosecutors ain't bought into it. But the ones that have, thank God they're in a leadership position. And they said, no, let's give it a try. Let's see how this thing is gonna work out. And so we out on the limb, we experiment with this thing and we got some successes that we can point to, you know, a lot of them. And so they're starting to say more and more of these cases are now being referred to common justice. It's, you know, you just gotta have a conversation with people. Because everyone knows that this system that we got in place is not working. It's not working. In fact, it's doing more harm than anything else. Yeah, and I thank you for that, Shua. That was powerful. Um, only thing I would add to that, I mean, there's just, you know, there's a number of different like abolitionist models, and like ideally we want a model. And that's why I like love story stuff justice when I first heard about it, because it was like a system that was totally um, outside of the carceral system as I understood it. So it was like, you know, bringing that accountability into our communities and having people in our communities who caused harm and responsible parties come together, which is huge. But another abolitionist model is actually a diversion model. And diversion model is like diverting people out of the criminal legal system. And you can't do that model unless you actually, you know, work with district attorneys, unless you actually work with prosecutors to slowly but surely divert people out of the system. And that's that's why we work so closely with the criminal legal system. One of the reasons why we work so closely with the criminal legal system. Thank you, Kira. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna get to this other question someone asked uh, a while ago. Um, question about these conversations on our teams regarding Richard's discussion. What would you say to white supervisors on call who supervise BIPOC staff around creating space for these conversations? around complex lived trauma of racism while actually addressing power dynamics, uh, especially knowing BIPOC staff are more predominantly in direct service positions versus supervisory ones at so many of our organizations, then what would you offer a BIPOC in those situations who feel they may need to explain these experiences in order to be seen versus they potentially enduring punitive consequences in the workplace? that replicate larger harm around racism and carceral systems. Um, and I'm gonna say something about this one real quick before I hand it off to my colleagues. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if everyone here was here for my intro, but I said that, you know, as a comms person, 
my greatest challenge, our greatest challenge in the comms team is like Schwab brought up earlier, is describing water to fish, right? People who privilege from white supremacy do not see, they are the fish, they do not see the water. And I heard, I heard something great yesterday. <clears throat> it does not matter how you look. It does not matter if you come off as the angry black person or the angry brown person, as long as you are describing that water to the fish, because they will hear you, right? Um, and that is our challenge as well as in the communications department is most of our trolls um, are white men, obviously, um, because they don't they don't understand they 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 have no concept of how they they don't feel that they're privileging in any way. They're like I don't I don't have no privilege, you know. That's obviously like one of the the main things that they say. Um, <clears throat> but they don't see like how are they going to see something that has never affected them in, in a way um so i think to you know though it is an emotional labor it is necessary um always so with that i'll pass it off to my colleagues to to address that one um I mean, one of the quick things, answers and thoughts come to mind is like organizing, right? Um, don't go at it alone, right? Identify your colleagues who, who feel the same way and come at it as a united front, right? So it's not, so it doesn't leave you susceptible to be singled out as the angry person, right? And then, you know, because, you know, um, um, we know that it's going to require strength and, and power uh, to get people who have not seen things um, that are all around them to act on. It's also going to require, you know, it's, it, the knowledge is not sufficient. The knowledge has been out there. The information has been out there. The research is out there. The data, like all of that is out there. But people will still continue to do it. And that's where the strength becomes the next phase and the, and the work that needs to be done. And you shouldn't have to do it alone. Identify folks who, who share your values, who feel the same experiences of oppression and denial of, of their voice in that space and go at it at a unified front. Um, but one of the things that always comes to mind when we get to this point of the conversation, because this is just the reality of it, right? Operating in these systems that are led by white folks who don't, who, who maybe don't get it, right? They don't see it, um, is um, Maya Angelou said, um, out of all of the, the principles, right? Um, she considered courage to be the most significant. She said, because without courage, you can be just, but you would only be just like erratically, right? You could be fair, but it'd be like erratic. It wouldn't be consistent. Right, um, but it requires courage to to be just, to be fair, um, to have that voice when you're faced with an opposition that can cause you harm. Um, and so, this is not to minimize that if a person doesn't feel like that role is for them, recognize what role other people can play who share your experiences. And I think the, it goes back. So what I said, the first thing is just organize, organize and organize so we can build the power of the people, um, even in your workspaces, to be able to have their voices be heard. Thank you, Richard. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to address some of these questions in the Q&A as well. Um, <clears throat> I saw a really great one. Sorry, um, there's a couple of comments in the Q and A, so I'm trying to trying to skip those. Um, uh, excuse me. So trauma. This is from Regina Griego. Um, trauma is an ongoing process when you are supporting the responsible party 
from the family who harmed another family member. Is there such a thing as chronic trauma in this work? I'm not sure if I understand that question completely. Trauma is an ongoing process. Okay, when, when it's a, like a family member, all right? Um, is there, yeah. Um, so I guess that, that question would be for Schwab and, and Marjorie who are trauma support. Yeah, yeah is there such a thing as chronic trauma in, in this work? Yeah, I'm just looking at this question and, and reading it. I mean, yes, absolutely. There is chronic trauma. There is complex and compound trauma. You know, I think something that Richard named at the top was really around um, how complex trauma is and how persistent it is. And if somebody is coming to common justice because they're harmed by violence, it's not the first time that it's likely not the first time they've been harmed, uh, you know, or the first time they've experienced trauma, particularly like Richard named again, you know, people of color and black people who have experienced trauma through colonization, through slavery in the United States forever, um, since, since the beginning. So um, there's, there is so much complex, there's complex, complex trauma, you know, like complex trauma is a clinical term, but it's, it's like, it's more than, it's more than just that clinical term. It's systemic, it's cultural, it's, you know, white supremacy, it's oppression, it's uh, lack of resources, um, generational. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, so so I feel like the short answer is like, yes, there is there is chronic trauma. Um, and unfortunately I lost the question, so I'm, I'll stop there um, for someone else to jump in. All right, I'm gonna address um, a couple of just basic uh, questions. Um, there will be a recording that we will be sending out to everyone um, and we will caption them as well for those who, who might be deaf or hard of hearing who, are, are, who weren't able to attend today. Um, so if you have colleagues or I believe there's even a class here with us today um, that may be uh, deaf or hard of hearing, um, we, we will be sending those uh, out with the closed captions. Um, and also, this is a question to all the panelists. People want to know if they can email you directly um, to follow up with your work. Um, and if we can, if we will be sharing um, emails. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. And I'll say something quickly to address a question about people who've been harmed by family members. I, it is complex trauma, I think, particularly because if you're harmed by someone who, who's close to you, who you love, oftentimes you try, it's hard for you to um, grapple with that harm. And a lot of times you make excuses for it. And I think a lot of times, especially if it happens when you're younger, a lot of times it causes dissociation, which has like huge impacts on you throughout your entire life. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's much more complex when you are harmed by a family member. Yeah. And that's why I'm glad we have people on our team who's like working with people who have dealt with such complex trauma. What were you gonna say, Marjorie? You go. No, I was gonna ask another question. I was saying, Jose, I see him in the column here. Uh, Jose Saldana, he's, uh, he was with me in Shuanga when we did those restorative circles. And he can tell you how transformative it was, you know, just having those conversations around accountability and what we can do to help, you know, restore some of the harm that we've, uh, that we've caused how to fix it. Uh, again, that was the beginning of our processes of doing sorry. We started there while we were still locked up and it's continued. Jose Saldana is the, the uh, ED of uh, executive director of RAP, you know, uh, which is a, a very powerful organization uh, moving towards the eradication of prison, but particularly, you know, towards the releasing of aging prisoners who are still incarcerated. I just want to give a shout out to Jose and Matt for the work you're doing, man. And thank you so much, you know, for, for being that voice for those who are still incarcerated. 
All right, I'm going to go to this question um, from uh, Jose Pineda. What do you think the role of restorative, of restorative justice is in the prisoner re-entry area? It, it should begin with, of course, the accountability. You know, men and women who are coming home from prison, you know, if they've been there for any long stretches of time, you know, if they're given the opportunity or they're giving um, or steered in the right direction of joining those types of organizations, such as Common Justice, because we do outreach in the community, you know, do we do trauma education, we talk about some of these hard issues about being responsible and now becoming a, I'm a hard party becoming responsible. So we have these conversations. So, uh, and many of them are turning in some kind of way towards a route where they can begin to do sorry. You know, I chose, you know, I have an extensive background, education, I'm in business, I have my own business before I went away. And I, you know, deliberately chose not to take that route. I could have been a millionaire seven times over. But as you know, if you do social work, you're not, you're not doing this for the money. <laughs> There's no way to give, you know, my ultimate millionaire here, you know. So I'm doing it because this this is part of my redemption walk, you know, and is to do sorry. And uh, I chose this route. No one there directed me, but I'm not the only one. Thousands of us are doing this work, tens of thousands around the country. And so restorative justice for those who are coming home or those, whether it's restorative justice or transformative justice. And Richard, I need you to speak to that because that was a question that was raised up in the, in one of the chats, uh, on the, the Q&As about the tension between restorative justice and transformative justice, because it does need to be clarified. You know, it's not a, it shouldn't be a conflict, but I'll let you speak to it because Richard's the expert there. Thank you, sir. Uh, appreciate that shout out. I don't know if I'm an expert, but um, what I will say, I, I wanted to touch on that re-entry uh, question because I think I think one of the things that's missing um, I've been fortunate enough to like connect with people a lot of folks who are doing reentry work is like information about trauma and healing is missing from reentry programs I think that that should precede restorative work right uh, understanding that uh, the people who are returning like beyond just getting your basic needs met of food housing and clothing right so that you can successfully like reacclimate, um, there needs to be equally a commitment um, to to recognizing the harm that you've experienced as a result of your incarceration, the harm that you experienced before your incarceration, um, how that impacts your body, and what does healing look like. And unfortunately, not a lot of um, reentry programs have under, you know understand that. Um, you know, I had, to, I had a chance uh, doing a national listening tour that I was a part of to interview some folks at a, a pretty well-established reentry program. Um, and when we started talking about victim services and when we started talking about victims, uh, their response was that, you know, um, we got to stop thinking like victims, right? We got to stop playing the victim role. We need to do what we need to do in order to get ourselves together overcome these obstacles and be survivors and thrivers. And I remember being in that session and saying, damn, like, you know, these are the people who are responsible for like holding the hands and providing the love and support of those who are coming out to the community. And the folks who were talking about it were also formerly incarcerated people, right? Because that's the piece that happens as well, right? We, we can easily get caught up in like, you know, I was able to do it, right? And so I can show you how to do it. But, the fact that this trauma not only just influences our capacity to like function, right? When we even talk about like resilience, we're not just talking about bouncing back to a state of functionality. We're talking about thriving in a real way that only healing is conducive to, right? So that not only are you just getting your basic needs met and you have an apartment, you have a job, but how is your interactions with your significant other? How is your interactions with your children? Is your trauma influencing the way that you treat each other, right? And then when you get in this job, and, and let's say you get into this work, is your trauma influencing how you interact with your colleagues, right? Who are also doing this work. Because oftentimes we find that in these organizations that are committed to social justice, you know, criminal justice reform, there's a lot of people who've been justice impacted, but we don't think about that impact in a way to, to really be committed to creating organizational coaches that are rooted in healing-centered approaches. 
so that we can live out that value um, to the extent that we want it to be a part of the world that we envision living in. So I think um, the reentry programs need to be, you know, focused on, on trauma and healing, like the impact of harm um, and trauma. Uh, they need to be steeped in that. And they also need to be steeped in what healing looks like, you know, um, for the folks who are in these reentry programs. Uh, they got some powerful comments going on in the chat. I'm looking here in the chat, you know. Uh, I like one, who's it, Stan M? He says, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, America is a pro-fascist failed state. Racism and sexism were the first pandemic. Police came from slave patrols. Cages came from slavery. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, saying that, you know, putting in a very concise way, because that is absolutely true. And uh, oh, there's something else I've seen over here. Uh, there was a question about mentally uh, ill people who, what does restorative justice look like for them? My only comment on that is they shouldn't even be considered criminal if they're not responsible. They shouldn't be considered, but of course we do know, and I've seen it while I was Locked up, they'll lock up the people who are mentally disturbed. They had a facility where they had some facility who were blind. You know, everybody there was blind, you know, and they're doing life sentences, you know. Uh, people who are paralyzed in a wheelchair from the waist down, can't even, can't even hardly lift their arms up. They're still incarcerated in the state of New York. This is crazy, you know. So people who are disabled, people who have a mental illness, should not even be targeted in the same way. It, it's people who are, who are normally responsible and capable. Does that mean that they get a free pass? You no, know, that means that they get extra extra support and treatment that they need. And for them to understand if they're capable of understanding the accountability. You know, so of course, restorative justice, you know, again, it's, it's just a, a broad film. And when you say restorative, we restore it. Re, not just restoring justice, Restoring peace, tranquility, and balance in the community where we care for one another, where we look out for one another, heal one another. You know, we're a place for healing, conversation, you know, and looking for another way other than locking somebody up. Thank you, Shoy, Shoy for addressing that one. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go to a, a question from Stuart Green before we um, close up today. Uh, this distinction between victim and survivor is so important. The legal system has appropriated the naming of who really matters and what people need. How can those who challenge the carceral system change the narrative and frame it in the ways you are doing this morning? Is the starting point media or the legal system? Um, and and I'll, I'll comment on that question as, as a person in communications. And I saw someone was asking for, for my email as well. And I'll send that out shortly. Um, so I think it begins, first of all, with yourself, right? Um, language um, has, there's a quote that I heard, it's, it's language in, in America has like the, life expands the life expectancy of of a soap bubble and what that means is words are constantly changing all the time right um not even 10 years ago i was never asked what my pronouns were um and now it is rude to not ask you know what someone's pronouns are um and our language is constantly shifting every single day and i think we need to be one steadfast in in making sure that people use the correct terminology but also patient um, as people learn um, and what that means is learning how to not use the language ourselves first to use a, a particular kind of language ourselves first before asking other people to join that movement with us and yes media plays a huge role um, in that I, I am, you know, someone, my, my education is in journalism um, through and through. I have my bachelor's degree, my master's degree is in journalism. And it's something that I see a lot, the way that the media talks about people of color um, 
to this day needs to be changed. And I think that that needs to be addressed. Um, and the way that the media talks about people who are involved with the criminal legal system is still problematic and needs to be addressed. Um, so I think it's twofold. I think it starts with ourselves and our communities, but also with the media. Um, and then I think the criminal legal system, to Schweib's point, there are a lot of um, really great progressive prosecutors coming out of uh, law schools. Um, and hopefully they are being taught this language as well. Um, but I'll let the other panelists address that. I think about how um, white supremacy is such a thorough system. You know, it impacts every, like has been said many times, water to a fish. It impacts every interaction, every community, every system. And similarly, change needs to be just as thorough. You know, so as we think about how to make restorative conversations and dialogues part of the way we exist in the world, it means like, oh God, I'm trying to remember Project Mia. I saw like they just, they published something about restorative practices in parenting. Um, you know, it's not just, it's not just in, there's a lot of restorative justice work in schools. Like it's not just isolated to the criminal legal system or to this kind of conflict or that kind of conflict, restorative practices and restorative ways of relating to each other that focus on accountability. Um, you know, that's, that's something we can bring to every aspect of our lives, which includes your social media platform and how you interact with someone when you walk down the street. All right, we've got a lot of questions in the chat. Um, uh, is redemption a part of the process for restorative just for the restorative justice model? It is often overlooked or accepted by Sharon Gandarilla or Gandaria, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, uh, is is it part of the process of the restorative justice model? This is an interesting question, and and I saw mention of redemption. Um, earlier on, and I don't know that I have a great answer, except to it, redemption makes me think about this notion of forgiveness um, and how that doesn't necessarily have to be a part of, of the process. Um, or, yeah, I wonder if, if any other folks have thoughts on, on this idea of redemption and, and restorative justice. Uh, redemption is more of a personal, spiritual, has a religious, theological foundation. And uh, that was my comment, speaking personally about my own particular journey. Uh, it uh, coincides with a restorative justice outcome, which is, for me, accepting responsibility, being accountable, and doing sorry. So these are... Uh, ways in which what motivates me is my own sense of redemption, being able to understand that I can restore myself, you know, and being able to look in the mirror and look, see the person looking back at me, somebody that I like, <laughs> whereas before someone I was ashamed of, angry with, and um, had a lot of issues with because, you know, I saw myself as myself. And now, you know, uh, being redeemed is being uh, a society accepting me and I'm being redeemed in the sense that I've been able to come here and work at Common Justice to, you know, to fulfill a, a life ambition of my own in terms of trying to work in the community and to work with people who have been harmed as well as those who uh, have harmed them. And because I've been on both sides and I understand you know, what is necessary in, in order to help to restore the peace. I, my, you know, my vision is to one day see uh, uh, our communities as a peaceful place again. You know, where people can walk the streets. You don't have to lock your doors. You don't have to be afraid. You know, and it's that's that's the vision for me. You know, because I I know that it's possible, but we have to be thinking in a different kind of way. You know, um, I've seen a comment earlier in the uh, Q and A about uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu. That man inspired me, man. You know, particularly with the Truth and Reconciliation Councils in South in South Africa. You know, uh, 
to bring to an end apartheid, but also to hold accountable those who have caused so much harm, you know, and if, you know, and to see those, you know, videos and 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 and, and televised uh, sessions uh, or those truth and reconciliation councils, how they were able to utilize restorative justice as the way to keep the country together, and they help resolve those and start the healing process of those wounds that apartheid had caused for generations, you know, and that was the tool that they used, restorative justice, which is true to their cultural heritage. The majority of people in, in South Africa come from those societies, those tribal societies, ancient societies, but this was how they resolved issues. And if they can do it on a national level, you know, I just want to see it in the community, <laughs> you know, when we can get gang leaders and people who have done so much harm begin to have a conversation with each other to help to restore the peace. That's my vision. That's why I'm doing this work. I want to see that. I, I want to see a truth and reconciliation council take place in all of the urban communities where there's so much violence going on and bring the parties together to resolve those issues and to create and restore the peace in our communities and restore the balance. That's that's what my goal is. You know, the larger people about the society here in America, whew, you know, everybody's got to do it wherever they are, you know? And I would advise you to start with your own family. I'm the elder in my family. And so I'm in a position to, you know, help resolve old family arguments and beef, things that took place while I was still locked up. I'm coming home, getting hit with all kinds of crazy, ugly stories and trying to bring some reconciliation in the family you know, utilizing restorative principles, you know, so I'm not just talking and I'm walking and I'm living it, you know, because I see it works. It works, you know, and so I want to see it take place on the community level. So um, that's, that's my little two cents. Thank you, Shwad. And before we head out, because I don't think we only got like three minutes left. Um, I want to ask Kira, what is what is the call to action for for everyone today? And I know there are some amazing questions um, that are in the Q and A. Uh, and this is going to be a quarterly series, so check in with us in the next um, couple of months. This is going to be a continuing conversation as we discuss different topics. Um, what is what is a healing equity look like, and what can our attendant attendees do to support healing equity? Um, yeah, so I'll give two calls to action. One is just like, you know, there was like, thank you all for your wisdom. And thank you all for like sharing from the depths of your hearts today. And I feel like we gave um, the people who are in our audience a lot of important information. So I would just like urge everyone who's listening to make sure you like take this conversation outside of like this Zoom webinar and like, and talk to people in your family, talk to people in your community and continue the conversation. Um, the other more concrete call to action is that, you know, we just started our common justice has really just started our organizing and policy work. And one of the first like policy initiatives that we are going to move forward is um, regarding a law in New York and most states have this law that basically says that survivors of violence um, they can't receive victim compensation funds unless they report what happened to them to the police. So we are working with a number here, us here at Common Justice, we're working with a number of victim service advocates to try to change that law. Most likely we'll be changing that law through legislation. Um, and we're in the process of doing that now. We're gonna be sending out a petition soon. And if you signed up for this webinar, you'll probably be getting the petition through an email. So please sign the petition. When you see the petition about Office of Victim Services and changing the police reporting um, um, requirement, um, and we'll make sure to keep you abreast of all our steps moving forward, which will hopefully include legislation. So um, yeah, please look out for that petition. Please sign it, please stay updated on our work. And please reach out to Emil Say and tell, let Emil Say, now I'm gonna give you three things and let Emil Say um, know other things you want to hear from us as far as the common justice team, you know? So as you can see here, we have a wealth of information and knowledge. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Emil Say. Thank you, everyone. And I wanna bring up one other point that um, I, I feel like I need to mention um, that Schwab um, in South Africa, they never, 
um, once a person is comes out of prison, um, they do not get their uh, right to vote taken away. And the reason for that is because South Africa has decided that it would be wrong to see any member of society be less than a full citizen because of their history of colonization. So I also want to throw that in there that, you know, restoring the right to vote to all people is just, it's a continued form of slavery. And I, I just wanted to address that. Um, that's also really important work. Um, so please, like, it's, we're all fully human. We're all fully, it doesn't matter if we're citizens of this country or not, everyone is a full human. And I think that legislation needs to change as well. Um, and so we will be sending emails around um, soon. If you're not signed up for our newsletter, please do sign up. We're not one of those annoying organizations that sends emails out every day or even every week. It's once a month. So um, if you want to keep up to date, um, keep in touch with us and stay up to date with the work that we're doing and the policies that we're trying to um, change, uh, please sign up for that newsletter. And also, Until We Reckon, Violence, Mass Incarceration, and A Road to Repair is now available in paperback. So if you're not able to get the hard copy, um, it's in paperback also. Um, so please, please, please read it um, by our ED, Danielle Sored. Um, she's amazing and it's she's, you know, really set up a lot of the language that we use here at Common Justice. So if you'd like to know more about what we do, you can also read her book there. Um, and thanks everyone. And thank you to all the panelists and everyone that participated in the chat today. Um, such a, a great audience. So thank you, thank you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Emil Say. Thank, thank, thank you, Emil Say, who put this all together. Great job. Great job, everyone. Thanks, right. everyone. Bye.